All right, let's settle in for our meditation. So we'll begin like we've been doing, chanting the four quarters chant. <clears throat> now let us make the four boundless qualities shine forth. I will abide pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth, so above and below, around and everywhere, and to all as to myself. I will abide, pervading the all-encompassing world, with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. I will abide, pervading one quarter, with a mind imbued with compassion, likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth, so above and below around and everywhere, and to all as to myself. I will abide, pervading the all-encompassing world, with a mind imbued with compassion, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility, and without ill will. I will abide, pervading one quarter, with a mind imbued with gladness, likewise the second, likewise the third, Likewise the fourth, so above and below, around and everywhere, and to all as to myself. I will abide, pervading the all-encompassing world, with a mind imbued with gladness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. I will abide, pervading one quarter, with a mind imbued with equanimity, likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth, so above and below, around and everywhere, and to all as to myself. I will abide, pervading the all-encompassing world, with a mind imbued with equanimity, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will.
So taking the time to settle. And to open to our experience. Feeling the body as it is tonight. Feeling the heart as it is tonight. And seeing whether it's possible to abide in a open-hearted relationship with this ordinary experience of sitting In order to have a relationship with this moment, we need to be sensitive, putting aside our usual distractions, preoccupations, coming home to this moment, meeting the moment as it is, Relaxing the body and mind as much as possible. And receiving sensations in the body, sounds, emotion, mental activity, whatever arises and is known. We're seeing whether it can be met in the space of a kind awareness, accepting, allowing, making room for whatever presents itself, arises and passes, like a guest that we welcome and allow to leave when it's time. So in this way, we can settle back, relax. We're not controlling our experience. We're judging it. It's not needed. But we are cultivating a presence, an interest. And we could say more, we're more interested in the quality of awareness, quality of the mind, than in the different objects of awareness that come and go. What if this space of awareness itself could have the flavor of a beautiful, welcoming, benevolent space in which anything is allowed to arise and pass so perhaps during this meditation, we can explore this, being more interested in the qualities of the awareness and simply allowing what arises and passes to do so. Can the quality of awareness be benevolent compassionate, appreciative, non-contentious, 
as we simply meet moment by moment what's here in the body and mind. So let's continue in silence.
not trying to solve any problem, figure anything out. Simply connect. And if we're having a hard time connecting, you can always remember our friend, mindfulness of the body, not as a particular technique necessarily, but simply this remembering to connect. with whatever aspect of having a body is obvious. We're just doing our best to be here. Relax the body, relax the habitual activity of the mind enough that we can be here, be with ourselves in a relaxed, compassionate way, as if we were just sitting with a friend or another being, just bearing witness, being with providing presence, and we can see what effect that presence has when the only intention is to be with, with kindness.
for the last minute or two. If there's any discomfort in the body or mind or heart, seeing whether it's possible to include that experience and even any aversion or resistance in a kind of compassionate awareness that makes room, understands, forgives, holds it with gentleness, I was just sitting in a kind of compassionate awareness that can include any difficulty that might be present. Letting it touch the heart. We'll take a minute or two if people want to stretch. Nice to be here with everyone. For anyone who doesn't know me, my name is Gabe Keller Flores. Happy to be teaching tonight as part of the Buddhist studies class on the benevolent heart. <clears throat> so tonight I wanna uh, explore a question about what a beautiful response to suffering might be, might look like. A response to suffering that is enlivening, maybe even joyful. And I think this should uh, maybe be intriguing or be interesting and yeah, maybe raise more questions. Um, maybe it isn't obvious what that might be, what that might look like. And I think that's 
maybe a good way to think about it as an exploration instead of just an answer. <laughs> and then we, we do that or we try to do that and find that we can't or you know, it doesn't seem like we can, and then we judge ourselves for that. But just to ask that question, does our heart know, has it had any experience with what we would call a beautiful response to suffering? And just, yeah, to kind of get interested, what is that flavor? What have those experiences been like? Um, because I think it's a relevant question because there is suffering. And this is um, something we talk about a lot as Buddhists. And we talk about wanting to be free of suffering. Uh, but it's really in meeting suffering that we are transformed, that our our wisdom, our heart, our compassion gets transformed. This word wisdom sometimes evokes, it can also mean in English, um, knowledge, so we can, it can be very head oriented. Um, one teacher that I like a lot, Ajahn Suchito in um, England, talks about wisdom as know-how. Um, and I think that's a little bit more practical. And in terms of the heart, you know, our hearts do, do learn and they do become wiser, but we wouldn't, you know, we might have, we might put that into words, but I think a lot of, at least in my experience, how the heart becomes wiser is it's kind of, it's through, through feeling and through that willingness to meet suffering and learn, learn what feels like a more uh, useful response and what's just more of the same, not helpful. So this arena of a beautiful response to suffering, uh, you could we could kind of think of it in two ways, which often are talked about as sort of complementary approaches of compassion and wisdom. With compassion maybe being more about an effective um, heart quality, and wisdom being more again maybe head based. But um, I think real wisdom is something that we know on a deeper level than that. And it's motivated by compassion. Now, wisdom isn't, in Buddhism, wisdom isn't for the sake of just knowing things. <laughs> uh, wisdom is about suffering. Wisdom is what is understanding, having some really mostly, I think, lived experience of what works. So it's pragmatic. And it's based on the intention to, yeah, that cares about suffering, our own and others. So I think in a way, what I'm saying is maybe these two aren't so different, compassion and wisdom. Maybe one is more the motivation and the other is more the, you know, what do we do with our compassion? like letting go, we often think of letting go as a wisdom uh, practice. But also we let go because of compassion, because it hurts to hold on. It's like the uh, simile that's given of holding a hot pan. And wisdom is realizing we're holding the hot pan. And compassion is we let it go because it hurts. So they go together. But traditionally, we talk about compassion as uh, one of the four Brahma Viharas, a quality of the heart that um, can be cultivated as a beautiful um, 
intention in the heart, intention in the mind, as a way to meet life in all of its different flavors. So compassion is, you could say, the wisdom that knows how to meet suffering, that knows how to meet when things are hard, challenging. And maybe we've had that experience either in ourselves or with, with somebody else. I think one of, in my experience, one of the sort of telltale signs of compassion is that sense of sort of, of wisdom or of know how someone who has some confidence, they're not afraid of suffering. They, they know what to do in the moment. It's not, maybe they don't know how to make it go away necessarily, but they know how to show up. You know, just that ability of knowing how to show up. And, and just that can be healing as probably we've experienced. So this is, uh, this is, um, yeah, in a way, maybe paradoxical or, yeah, not, uh, maybe not our inclination to meet suffering in this way, to have it be a cause for unenlivened, beautiful response. How often is that our experience, either towards our own suffering, towards the suffering of others, suffering that we, we see around us, and I think an important point here is um, maybe differentiating compassion from just feeling the suffering of ourselves or, or being aware of the suffering that we have or that others have. Compassion is uh, in, in, um, in Buddhism, in early Buddhism, it's really... The, the reason that it's beautiful is that it's not just connected to suffering, but it's connected to the wish to relieve suffering. Um, the image that's given is of becoming aware, coming across a traveler who's been traveling for many days and is hungry and, and thirsty. And just that very natural wish that would arise, oh, it would be really great. It would be really good for this person to, to sit down, to rest, to have some food and water. And if there was something I could do about that, of course, I would do that. So that's, that's why compassion is beautiful and even joyful, perhaps, at times. And so it's a very specific kind of happiness, joy, beauty, uh, you know, that is connected to suffering. So it's bittersweet in, in a way, you know, it's not, yeah, it's, um, it, it's uh, one image that's given for it is of the sunset. So the, the four Brahma Vahars, I think, I think this comes from Bhikkhu Nalio, these four images of the four Brahma Viharas, so metta being, I'll see if I can remember this. I think metta being like the, just the sun in the middle of the sky, I think, because I think mudita is the sunrise. Yeah, so I think metta, just benevolence, goodwill, is, is just the sun shining equally in all, directs, in all directions, bright, sunny day. Compassion is the sun setting. So it's that kind of, it's beautiful, but it, you know, maybe there's some sadness that the day is ending and there's some poignancy, it's connected to, to impermanence or to suffering. And then appreciative joy is sunrise, so just that brightness and you know, kind of joyfulness. And equanimity is the light of the moon. So there's a coolness to it, still beautiful, but, uh, but more peaceful, maybe. So 
So this flavor of compassion that um, is connected to suffering, but is beautiful because it's the heart is is open with that suffering, and um, yeah, not turning away, and crucially has that motivation of I care about this, and if there's something I can do, let me do it. Let me not hold back. Let me be in relationship, be in connection. And I'm sure we've all experienced this just in little ways, how good it feels, you know, to do, you know, to offer a, an ear to someone who's struggling to just, you know, take a few minutes out of our day to be with someone when, when they're struggling and, and that could really be supportive. So I think this is an important point that I was reflecting on today, just for this quality of compassion to really um, be felt in that way that's beautiful, that's uplifting instead of despair and feeling disempowered, feeling burdened by the suffering that we experience of others. It really has to be connected to that wish to alleviate suffering. And sometimes there's something we can do and sometimes there isn't. But even if we can't do anything to change a situation, we can still care and we can know that we care. And even that, in a way, is doing something, sending our good wishes or just knowing or even taking the time to think, you know, is there anything I can do? No, maybe no, not really, but, you know, I can wish well, I can wish if, you know, if there's any way in which this suffering could be alleviated, I really wish that because I really care. You know, and how many people just need their stuff, you know, just to not maybe underestimate the power of witnessing, of knowing, caring, and maybe creative responses that, that might arise. But I was thinking about this, yeah, just in terms of um, what's enlivening for us. Because I don't think any of us who are here at a Buddhist meditation center are in denial about the truth of suffering, <laughs> whether it's in our own hearts or in the world. But this question, what is a beautiful response to suffering, I think isn't so clear. And... Uh, yeah. So I think it's a worthy exploration and, and and I think it gets to the heart of 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 the Buddha's teachings because suffering is central but it's about the alleviation of suffering. <laughs> it's about the freedom from suffering. So this can really be a guiding principle and motivation in our practice. What is uh, you know, in what ways, big, small, you know, in everyday life, in meditation practice, how are we um, at, uh, following that question of how are we relating to, to the suffering that is part of life? And instead of it being a burden or something that we avoid or something that we're embarrassed about as a personal failing? How is it something that really motivates us? Oh yeah, this is relevant. This is important. I really care about this. Is there anything that can be done? And that's really, that's the question. <laughs> and that's why the Buddha taught, because there is something that can be done. So it's, it's good news. It doesn't mean we can solve all the world's suffering through our willpower, but we can care about all the world's suffering, care about the ways that we contribute to the world's suffering. Maybe start there. <laughs> Just all the ways that our own heart suffers. And, you know, this being, the closest being that we have the most... Um, you know, effect on, you know, how do we relate to ourselves? 
we want to be compassionate towards the world, but how compassionate are we towards ourselves? How can we really open to others and their struggles and imperfections if we're not opening to our own, you know, really meeting ourselves, being real? It's not easy. And I mean, anyone who's practiced meditation, gone on meditation retreats, I think this is one of the fruits is just, yeah, this, um, this kind of <laughs> opening to dukkha, opening to suffering. But it's joyful. It's funny. It's funny how it's joyful. Uh, Joseph Goldstein, important teacher in our tradition, said something like, at a certain point in his practice, he started being happy every time he would notice suffering <laughs> because it was an opportunity to see how the mind was contributing to that. So this is a really classical motivation for practice, the, the wish of the compassionate wish to alleviate suffering. So it's both a fruit of our practice um, as we become more sensitive, you know, we just feel more and are more in touch with the ways that we contribute to our own suffering. And, and that naturally has impact on those around us. And we care about it. We just kind of sensitize ourselves to the point at which we can't bear, but, but do something about it, learn about it, open our hearts to it. So it's a fruit of practice and it's also a motivation. You know, the more we see, the more we're motivated to see what can be done. And um, I think there's different, obviously everyone's different, but I think for some people, this is a primary kind of engine and practice is this meeting of suffering and uh, being transformed through that willingness to meet it and learn from it. And um, I think for a lot of us, it's uh, not necessarily our first choice. <laughs> like we wish there is an easier way than to simply meet the suffering because it's not, not easy to be with, be with. And that's just a, a basic kind of principle. So I think, again, this is why, even just on a conceptual level, the idea of a beautiful way of, of relating to suffering can be helpful, that it can actually be enlivening, inspiring. And I think this has to do, too, with just the whole orientation around suffering in early Buddhism, that it's really, it's really central and it's something to be met and be interested in instead of avoided. But again, it's not, it's not to be attached to our suffering. You know, it really, it's a, uh, it is, we, it is suffering. <laughs> Nobody likes suffering, but it's, again, it's what is our relationship to that? Um, you know, and we can just ask that or, or, or look at that in our own experience. How often when we experience suffering or, or when we become aware of suffering in our own heart or, or outside, what is the first response? You know, it might be to judge ourselves, especially if we've been practicing a long time, like, well, the cause of suffering is clinging, so I'm clinging, so... I'm bad, <laughs> and I should know better. Um, one teacher I've been studying with, Gil Franz Dahl, has been emphasizing, instead of causation, um, or, yeah, instead of causation, uh, I'm forgetting the word, um, 
conditionality, I guess. Yeah. And uh, his, um, he's a scholar as well. So he, his point is that uh, instead of thinking of things in terms of causes, which can tend to reify sort of an agent, like, you know, who's the cause of my suffering? It's either me or it's someone out there. Or even clinging, or clinging to the cause of my suffering. And, well, somebody's clinging. So me, I, I'm the one to blame. Thinking of it more in terms of conditions. What are the condi necessary conditions for suffering to arise? And when we ask that, there's maybe a lot of conditions. You know, maybe, yeah, in this moment, you know, whatever example, there's some suffering. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of conditions at play here. Um, anyways, I found that a helpful thing to play with, making it a little less concrete and a little bit more, um, yeah, diffuse. And I totally lost my train of thought. Does anyone remember what I was talking about? <laughs> Luckily, I have notes. Oh, yeah, I think I was getting to, um, yeah, just how it, it may be, meeting suffering may be, um, may not be our, our first choice and maybe something that uh, we sort of, we, we get transformed and learn through that exposure, but, but it's, yeah, it may not be may not be something that that we're inclined to and and this right this kind of centrality of that interest i think that's helpful to whether it's compassion and the joy of of meeting it and being able to respond or it's interest being curious i think one way or the another we sort of have to in order to learn about suffering we sort of have to question what our default assumptions about it may be like it's either my fault or someone else's fault i mean that that's i don't know about you but that that's a pretty deep habit i'd say for me like it has to be someone's fault otherwise what do i do with it and i think compassion is sort of that answer you know what what is a beautiful response to suffering when we're not so interested and invested in finding out who's to blame so that we can um, hold them responsible. But, you know, it's like, it's conditions. So compassion, again, sort of like with wisdom, this pragmatic compassion is more interested in, you know, what are the conditions in place here that need to change so that the suffering changes? Because it's interesting, with all of our blaming, does it ever actually help? Like, does it ever, like, we find the person to blame, and then even if it's ourself, like, it's you, like, you're so bad. And then we're like, oh, yeah, I am bad. And then somehow that, no, it just, because that's just more aversion. It just reinforces the suffering. So it doesn't actually resolve the problem. In my understanding, my own heart, it's just a defense mechanism. It's just a way of avoiding feeling that truth, like this heart hurts. Uh, yeah, and a way of sort of kind of, well, if I, I can't accept that this heart could hurt like this, so I need to you know, find and isolate the cause as opposed to this heart hurts, what are the conditions that are, you know, that are here because I care, because I care about this, this heart hurting. So it's, you know, maybe a subtle difference, but it's really the flavor of the heart of from aversion to concern 
compassion. Yeah, I think a lot of a lot of our relationship to suffering has to do with this with this kind of either denial or um yeah, just it's hard. It is hard to accept that life has pain. <laughs> we would rather it not. But it can also be this is again the beautiful part of it is in meeting that truth, maybe there's something opens up that's, um, you know, the opportunity for something beautiful. If there was no pain in life, there would be no opportunity for compassion, for the beautiful wish to do something about it, whether it's for our own or, or somebody else's. Um, I'll read this classic description of of dukkha, which is often translated as suffering, because I think part of it is sort of this some kind of delusion that we have that we shouldn't suffer, that we shouldn't feel pain, and, and when we do, that it's a personal failing. And I think maybe in in this country, in this society, maybe that's a, a bit of a stronger delusion. Who knows? But I think this description of dukkha kind of is really broad and maybe will help us see how universal this experience is. So birth is dukkha, aging is dukkha, death is dukkha, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair are dukkha, association with the unbeloved is dukkha, separation from the loved is dukkha, not getting what is wanted is dukkha. In short, the five clinging aggregates are dukkha. So ways that we cling to our experience and sort of own and identify with and um, kind of take one part of our experience and isolate it, you know, either out of pain, like oh, this is the problem, so we isolate around it, or, or this is my salvation and isolate around that only to be disappointed at some point because we can't control it. So it's kind of like we're kind of in a, it's kind of a setup, you know, this to, you know, and, and this can be a cause for compassion and also maybe some relief that if we're experiencing pain or suffering, it's not because we're not smart enough, not clever enough. Maybe it's because actually when, once we start you know, becoming aware of it, sensitive to it. Uh, we're paying attention and we're noticing, oh, wow. Even when, you know, probably most of us in this room would identify as being relatively privileged. You know, it's all relative, but in the grand scheme of things, I certainly do. And yet, life is hard. So what do we do with that? Maybe it's a cause for a beautiful flowering of compassion. Life is hard, and I really care about that. Is there anything that can be done? Uh, one phrase that's often used is um, for, for one's own welfare and for the welfare of others. So just that question the Buddha would always ask and invite, invite us to ask, is what I'm about to do, is what I'm about to think, is what I'm about to say, for the benefit of myself and others, for the welfare of myself and others. So this compassionate intention, that's really, I think, the flowering of this being real around suffering is it becomes less and less tenable to kind of live a life of distraction, of superficiality, of self-centeredness. Not that we won't, you know, not that those habits won't still be active, but in terms of, I think the more that we open to this truth, the more it feels really relevant and really, yeah, something that is a, a worthy use of our energy. But again, I think that connection to the alleviation of suffering is really important. 
And I think that's maybe, it feels like part of the suffering of our modern time perhaps is that we have a lot of exposure to suffering, but maybe for different reasons, there's less of a clear connection to what we can do about it. You know, the phrase doom scrolling sort of epitomizes this of like, we're trying, maybe we're in some way, we're trying to connect to suffering. We're trying to connect to our world. And yet one of the main mediums uh, like social media to do this is really primed to just kind of activate us and uh, be less about, you know, forming real connections where we can then, you know, work together, solve problems. No, it's just, it's like whatever gets the most, whatever kind of our reactivity going is what gets elevated on those platforms. And it's not easy. It's not easy for, for many reasons to tap into that enlivening uh, compassion where it really feels like, you know, even just the opportunity to act, you know, to, to, to have the opportunity to experience compassion, we have to be in relationship to suffering. So for one thing, we have to have at least some inkling or some sense that this may be not just something to be completely avoided. <laughs> so something that maybe our heart is strong enough to meet and, you know, to respond to in a beautiful way. But then we also actually need the conditions in which that relationship can happen. And um, that involves some exposure. So that's, that's a whole other kind of area of, um, yeah, of exploration, you know, what is, how much safety do we need to feel kind of stable enough, grounded enough so that we can open to suffering? Um, because just being overwhelmed with suffering doesn't help anyone. But, uh, but there's kinds of suffering that I think are just, yeah, just part of being human, just every day, you know, vulnerability of being a human being and, and how much opportunity, I guess, do we have just to be in touch with that? And how much do we just sort of kind of have a delusion that it might be possible to escape anything uncomfortable? I think maybe that's part of what I'm getting at is I think our our mainstream society and just modern conveniences and working from home and, you know, not to um, malign any of those things, but just maybe a question of when does our pursuit of comfort and convenience and protection from the real exposure in life, but when does that slip into just an insulation where there's no opportunity to grow, meet our edge. You know, we may all have different edges. You know, if we've lived a life totally secluded from suffering, we may start just by, you know, noticing that our own body hurts or that, you know, so we can start in small ways. Um, but uh, yeah, this, I think this is a delusion to think that a life that is you know, prioritizing comfort and pleasure as opposed to prioritizing developing the heart so that it has the capacity to meet the, the, the full breadth of life. I mean, even just as a concept, doesn't that sound like a more reliable refuge developing the heart so that it can meet whatever comes. And again, like I was saying, we may have to learn this the hard way. We can't avoid suffering forever. <laughs> and maybe we're all here because we've realized that some of us maybe, yeah, 
maybe at different points. But this is good news because it's the beginning of being real and maybe learning a kind of joy, a kind of happiness that we wouldn't come across, that we wouldn't think of unless we had to meet suffering. The, the happiness of compassion, the happiness of, um, yeah, the heart that doesn't have to turn away, doesn't have to shy away. And once we can have some capacity in that regard, we can provide that for others. And that is one of the, yeah, one of the gifts we can give to each other, again, in really ordinary ways. And I really do see this connection between our own, you know, I, I think it's really hard to be patient, to be open, compassionate with somebody else if we can't with ourselves. And this is, you know, almost a cliche, but, um, you know, we're not, it's not like, it's not that different what we experience in this heart and what we experience outside in others. We can work with it wherever we, we become aware of it. So this, um, yeah, this meeting of suffering that uh, is less interested in causes and blame is one aspect um, of this kind of willingness to meet suffering and to ask really what's helpful. Um, yeah, and just in my own experience, I feel like there's been a, a lot of learning in this regard around anger and blame. And I, I find the Buddhist teachings in this area really, really clear. Um, it's really, it's really about what, what is helpful. And uh, yeah, there's, there is a letting go again, whether it's towards ourselves or towards others where we ask that question, you know, is this, this blaming, this anger, however justifiable it may be, but that sort of essentializing somebody, whether it's ourselves or others, as bad, is that ever helpful? It doesn't mean that we don't have, you know, that we can't have wisdom and assess, you know, who to be close to, who not to be close to, you know, be a, a wise being in, in social relationships, but just to be clear about what are the conditions that give rise to the, the suffering of hatred, of resentment, not being able to let go, not being able to forgive, and how much suffering comes from that, as maybe, maybe we've experienced. And not that this is easy or that it can be forced or that it happens quickly, but I think without some clear teachings, it's very easy to justify anger and hatred because because it's it's condoned socially. It's it, it does you know on a certain level it makes sense. Like it makes sense to assess you know different people. You know we don't want to be close to everyone, and this is a has been an important learning for me around metta goodwill that it it's not the same as wanting to be close like there's this little phrase i've been repeating um, from some of the early suttas about just a little phrase around snakes where they there were some snakes by the monastics and they said may the snakes be well may they depart because it doesn't do anyone any good to cohabitate with snakes like the snakes probably don't like it either so just that uh yeah, that kind of teasing apart can 
can our hearts remain open? And I think this is really the deepest reason for these teachings on the Brahma Viharas. It's about freedom of our heart. Can our, is it possible? And this is sort of a radical idea. Do our hearts have to constrict in this vulnerable, messy, unfair world where people at some point will probably not treat us well? Do our hearts have to contract, have to constrict, have to throw anyone out of our heart? Does that do anyone any good? Does that do us any good? Or is there another form of protection? So these four Brahma Viharas as protections of our heart, as ways of strengthening our heart um, so, that, so that it has an alternative. So we can think of these four flavors of um, of kindness as sort of the uh, the repertoire that we need in order to re to remain with an open heart in yeah with the full breadth of life. So does our heart have to close when things are really good? For some of us, it's hard to have an open heart when it's like we may have a story that life is really hard, and then things are really great in a moment, really beautiful. And can our heart open to that? So the full, the full breadth of it. And I think, and this is again like, um, because the point is to be free, to have a heart that's free so that we can be nimble, so that we can take care of what needs to be taken care of, so we're not weighed down unnecessarily. Life is already difficult. We don't need to add unnecessary suffering. And you know, can the heart be as free as possible to feel what it feels, to respond, to do what's helpful? So these ways that the heart gets weighed down, that's, I think, one of the main reasons for these teachings on, on love, on um, benevolence is to point to a possibility of the heart that is not weighed down in those ways. And when we experience that, even just for moments, we see that it is, it is a beautiful liberation of the heart. Um, the divine abidings, the uh, limitless, they can become limitless in the sense of there's there's nothing that could not be included, which we can understand even on a conceptual level. If, if a heart is really firm in that intention to include, to care, to be compassionate, what could arise that couldn't be included in that? And that's a worthwhile exploration because I'm sure there are experiences, people, memories, and we don't have to go to the hardest ones, but they will just come up as we practice. Oh, that's the edge. That's the part of myself, or that's the person where I'm justifying that that doesn't belong. And then we don't have to try to correct that story or anything, but that feeling itself of not acceptance, of resistance, keeping at a distance. Well, maybe that's really was an appropriate um, stance at some point, and we can even honor that. We don't have to change it. You know, that might, that's probably too aggressive, but just, well, can I start just by feeling that? What does that feel like to have this boundary, to have this place, these no-go areas? Oh, that's kind of, that hurts. That, And we can just care about that. So it's really, I think, this area of, relating to suffering is really in order to uh, have it, um, yeah, no, it, it has to be done carefully. It's not, yeah, it's not a competition. It's really about freedom of our heart. It's not about, yeah, proving anything. It's not forgiving other people. So for their sake, it's how, it's kind of an exploration in imagination.
because so often we're sort of wedded to maybe, yeah, this is just the way it is. This is just the way I am. You know? but, but yeah, what from the point of view of maybe stepping out so much of causes and these old stories, which again is why we meditate, because when we meditate, we might start with the story, but then we start to feel, we start to feel the body and, oh, this is just constriction. I mean, that story happened how many years ago, but this is here and now. This is constriction here and now. And it hurts and I care about that. And that's where the compassion and the wisdom really come together. And it's like, you know, um, Yeah, it's uh, it's releasing that fix, that um, hold on sorting everything out in our stories to, yeah, here in our direct experience, how we're impacted and how it impacts others, these wounds that we have. And can we just meet them? That's all, really. You know, we can do compassion practice in a more formal way. But uh, we can also just meet our, you know, meet, meet our suffering, meet our pain as best we can. Not turn away. I'll just read this little thing from Ajahn Suchitto, which I think is uh, summarizing what I've been talking about. You can spend ages attributing causes anywhere you choose along the self-other boundary, but that doesn't release the pain. Instead, you need the resolve to stay with it, to get to the truth behind the self-view. As you let go of all the discriminations and positions, your, <clears throat> your mind widens to include it all. This is where the latent tendency that is holding the self-other boundary gets released. I like that. This is where the latent tendency that is holding the self-other boundary gets released. That that self-other boundary is in itself a construction and a protection, you know. And that maybe that can be released. Because in the space of a compassion, a, a heart that's, you know, rooted in a compassionate wish, it, compassion was taught, or kindness, these practices were taught as protection practices for the monastics that were experiencing fear. So it's really, in a way, it's, it's a protection. It's primarily for our own heart so that we don't have to, we can feel confident that we're moving through the world wishing well. And when we're moving through the world wishing well, the world becomes less scary. Doesn't mean that there isn't still things to be aware of and be careful around, but it, yeah, it has an effect. So I'll just read a, a poem and then maybe there's time for a question or two or sharing. This is a classic poem that probably many of you have heard by Naomi Shihab Nye called Kindness. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go so you know how desolate the landscape can be between the regions of kindness. How you ride and ride thinking the bus will never stop. The passengers eating maize and chicken will stare out the window forever. Before you learn the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this could be you, how he too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore, only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to gaze at bread. 
only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for, and then goes with you everywhere, like a shadow or a friend. Thanks for your kind attention, everyone. And we have a few minutes if there's any anything you want to share and add or questions about anything I've said, either on Zoom or here. And if it's in here, if you don't mind coming up, you could sit on this bench. What comes to mind? Any experiences in your life of a beautiful response to suffering that you've seen, either your, your own or someone else's, that could be nice to hear that it's possible? The word empathy is very important. Hmm. Yeah, someone shared that the word empathy was important to them. Yeah, that's this. I think that's the start of compassion is that we have that capacity to feel, right? And then the wish to do something about it if possible. Yeah, Risa. I think both. You're okay with it. Thank you. Okay. Um. I had an amazing experience and it was a long time ago. Um, I was suffering a lot that particular day and um, I did something that you do when you're suffering, you go shopping. <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna change your life. And um, I was in Linden Hills and there was, and I don't know if it's still there, um, uh, eastern art artifact kind of shot i mean strange shot you know it, it kind of uh anyway i walked in there i'm looking at the buddhas and whatever else but i was just suffering and a woman came up to me and placed her hand on my forearm and looked me full on in the in the eyes with such compassion deep compassion and it filled my heart and i still remember it and and i came back to that shop i want to say you know i don't know, six months later or something like that saw the same woman she was sweeping up she didn't pay any attention to me at all so her compassion just was just a, a response, a movement of the heart. And I learned so much in that moment. And and it's been a, a really a, like a touchstone memory for me. Mm. Anyway, thanks. Mm. Thanks for sharing that. This is the, the upside of suffering. It's it's the opportunity for compassion and to receive compassion from ourselves or for some, from someone else. So maybe we can just let go of the words and sit together quietly for a minute. Maybe seeing if it's possible to simply include whatever is moving for us in our hearts. Thanks again, everyone. Really lovely to be with you. Wishing you a peaceful night. And we'll see you next week. Shelly will be back. <laughs>